9. And Moses said unto Pharaoh. Commentators differ as to the meaning of this passage. They are too speculative who expound it, that this honor was granted to Pharaoh, that he should fix the time in which Moses was to pray. Again, there is a flatness in the exposition, that Pharaoh might glory because the frogs were to die. Those who expound it, that Pharaoh should be freed from the frogs, so that he might glory in safety, express part of the meaning, but not the whole. It rather appears to me that there is an implied antithesis between the perverse boasting, wherewith Pharaoh had exalted, and that pious glowing which he ought to seek for in the mercy of God, as if Moses had said, Thus far you have exalted yourself improperly, trusting in your power, and afterwards when bewitched by the enchantments, now rather glory, because you have an intercessor and patron to plead for you to God. For it was needful that the arrogance, which had so falsely elevated him, that he dared to contend with God, should be crushed, and that no hope should be left him, save in the mercy of God. But to glory over Moses, means that he should seek his glory in the advocacy of Moses, and should account it a very great happiness that he should deign to interpose for his reconciliation with God. For the particle L, 93, is often so taken, Yet Moses by no means wished to detract at all from the glory of God, but, as I have lately said, desiring to humble the pride of the haughty king, he told him that nothing would be better and more glorious for him than to have a good hope of pardon, when he had obtained as his advocate the servant of the living God, whom he so cordially hated. He only affirms that the frogs should remain in the river, as much as to say that they should be content with their ordinary habitation and bounds, for we know that frogs, although they sometimes jump out on the bank, still do not go far from the water, because they are nourished by humidity. Thus he hints that they were let loose by God's command to cover the ground, and that it was still in his power, if he chose, that they should invade the fields and houses again in new multitudes, and that it must be ascribed to his blessing, if they kept themselves in the waters, and did not make incursions beyond their own boundaries. 10. And he said, Tomorrow. If you refer this to Moses, there is ambiguity in the sense, but, it being probable that they were Pharaoh's words, I think that he is asking for a respite till tomorrow, before he lets the people go. For they fall into an absurdity, who think that he asked Moses to drive away the frogs by his prayers on the morrow, as if Pharaoh went quietly to sleep, and put off the remedy of the evil. There is, then, no pretense for understanding it, that Pharaoh, as if his mind were quite tranquil and unmoved, desired to have his land delivered from the frogs on the following day, but rather it means, that if he be released from this difficulty, he promises the discharge of the people, but yet suspends it till the next day, for the purpose of deceit. For there was no other reason for this procrastination, except that, having obtained what he wanted, he might depart from his engagement, as he actually did, but Moses, satisfied with this promise, undertakes to bring it about that God should disperse the frogs, and this, I doubt not, was performed on the same day. For this was the cause of the tyrant's changing his determination, that, by the interposition of the night, his fear departed. And, certainly, it is gathered from the following words, that the frogs were soon after removed, for it is said that Moses and Aaron prayed after they had gone out, which would be but little in accordance with the notion, that the next day was waited for. It is not by any rash or presumptuous impulse that Moses affirms that Pharaoh should obtain his desire, because it appears from his success that he was assured of its being God's will. Thus often are the prophets, although no spoken revelation may intervene, directed nevertheless by the secret inspiration of the Spirit. In this confidence, also, Moses declares that Pharaoh should know that there is none other God to be compared with the God of Israel. This, moreover, is the true knowledge of God, when whatsoever lifts itself up to obscure his glory, is reduced to its proper level, and every high thing yields or is cast down, so that he alone may be exalted. 15. Blot when Pharaoh saw. Hence it appears that the wretched tyrant, like a winding serpent, twisted and turned his mind to crooked counsels, or when he was trembling beneath the present feeling of God's power, he dared not obstinately resist any longer, 
he only sought a little breathing time, now, being freed from fear, he returns to his former contumacy. But this is a sign of a perverse and crooked disposition, not to submit willingly, but to pay only a temporary deference, when necessity is more than usually urgent. God foreknew, and had foretold to Moses, that this perfidy was hidden in the recesses of his heart, but he was willing to bring it to light, and therefore remitted the punishment, and hence was the opportunity for dissembling. 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, In this place again, as before, Aaron is commanded to act as the inferior of Moses in punishing the tyrant, and this as being more ignominious than as if Moses alone had been employed. The nature of this third plague is very remarkable. God troubles Egypt not only with frogs, but with lice, for although the Hebrews are not entirely agreed as to the K&M, Kinem, yet they admit that they were little animals or insects, which produced shame together with annoyance even to the meanest of men. We see then how magnificently God trampled upon the pride of Egypt, by inflicting a punishment full of affront and disgrace, for although it would have been painful to sink under a powerful and warlike enemy, yet was it far more sad to be basely destroyed by lice. Nor can we doubt that God prepared such an army as this, principally that he might openly manifest how easily he can bring to naught in derision all earthly strength and power. And surely, Unless the Egyptians had been something more than stupid and beside themselves, this calculation would have come into their minds, what would hereafter happen, if the Maker of heaven and earth should apply himself to their destruction with all his might, when they perceive themselves to be wasted away in this almost ludicrous contest with him. But let us learn from this history, that all creatures are ready at God's lightest command whenever he chooses to make use of them to chastise his enemies, and again, that no animal is so vile and contemptible as not to have the power of doing injury when God employs it, and, finally, that reprobates obtain this at last by their proud doings, viz, that they are, with the greatest infamy, made to yield to the worms themselves, or to lice.